Hi, you found me, and we are at Ominously Positive Podcast, the place on the internet where you and I discuss dark topics with an upbeat tone. I'm Meriwether, I am your host, I am autistic, and I have OCD. Thanks for joining in today. We are experiencing a a lot of new technical difficulties. I have already recorded this podcast one time and it was an hour and I thought things were going really good and I was really driving and then I realized my brand new web camera stopped recording one minute into the podcast and all of the stuff they recorded was non-existent. So I'm back again. I'm recording on a different software. I will probably start using OBS Studio in the future, but that is taking a little bit of a learning curve. So today I'm just using the camera option that is available on my computer and crossing my fingers and really hoping that it goes through just fine. The reason I have this new fancy web camera is because of you guys and I just want to say thank you. I got the money from Google from my YouTube channel because you guys watch me, you share my videos or you give me watch time, you comment, you really hang out with me and I just want to say thanks. I took the money, I put it back into my channel. I bought a new web camera so you can actually see me when I do podcasts and I got a green screen which I spent like an hour trying to figure out how to use and um, I just made a mess of that. So we have new features coming up on our channel in the future if I can ever figure anything out and it's all because of you guys. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy seeing me today. I hope my voice does not annoy you too much today. I have a bit of a stuffy nose due to allergies. And I apologize for that, but the show has to go on, right? I don't want to miss out. Oh, and now my air conditioner is going to kick on. I'm I'm telling you, today is one of those days where the podcast is going all wrong. Excuse me, I will turn off that air conditioner. Oh my goodness, guys. I'm going to make a mess of everything. Oh, and it turned off just as soon as I stood up. Of course it did. (laughs) Wow. Okay. And what else is going on? Oh, um, my basement is flooded, so I can't use my water all that much because we had a lot of rain and now the basement flooded. And we're not on the city water or septic or anything like that, so we're kind of on our own with that kind of stuff. Other than that, things are going okay. <laughs> Just minor inconveniences, really. Anyways, this podcast I really wanted to do very good at, even though I'm failing because it was an important case to me. It's my very first case. My very first write-up. I didn't do a podcast for it because this podcast didn't exist then, but it's the very first one that got me into taking data and just writing it all down. And I went back to look at my work and I realized it was so bad. Like I did not do a very good job. Um, People complimented me and said I did a good job. But when I was reading it, I was like, ah, (laughs) I guess I just have a different method now. And I also kind of improved my own morale code. So I follow different rule, my own different personal rules for writing things now. So I've rewritten it and now I'm going to do the podcast for it. It is the Ashley Martinez case. She is an endangered runaway from St. Joseph, Missouri. We do not know if she is alive. We do not know if she has passed away or what has happened to her. So this is the first case I think on our channel where I don't have a murder. It's an unsolved missing persons. And I'd like to just jump into it because I've already recorded this once and I just want to go ahead and dig into this case. So I'm going to try to open my notes. That's the other good thing about this new camera is that um, 
I might have to mess with it a little bit, but you guys should be seeing my face directly on, and I should be able to read my notes directly on as well, so I'm not going to be like staring off into the corner or something like that, but, and you guys will be able to see me, so, <laughs> I'm pretty excited, uh, as you can tell, I'm a little jacked up, I've had like five Diet Cokes and stuff, so just a little more caffeine than usual, which is probably good today. Okay, I'm gonna stop babbling. Let's go. Let's get into this because it's gonna it's gonna take some brain power to talk about this one. Okay, Ashley Renee Martinez, and I'm just gonna read you my intros. I'm pretty much just gonna be reading directly from my notes. I kind of hope it helps smooth things along as we talk. No, I don't get like distracted like I have been. So, Ashley left her medications, her brand new pet kitten and a family that loved her and vanished one sunny day at the local pool. Ashley was a bright and a funny girl, and there is hope that she could be alive today. I have a personal accord here. My deepest respect in regards to Ashley's family who have been fighting her for her from since day one. I hope that they get the closure that they absolutely deserve for this case. Please, please, please. Be considerate when posting personal opinions about Ashley, because to this day, her mother actively runs a Facebook page and is involved in this case, so it would be kind if we're very careful with our wording. That way we're not harsh, that way we're not cruel, unnecessary cruel, you know, and things like that. I just put that in there because I've run across a couple of, in my opinion, callous opinions on this case, and I think... There's really no need for that, in my opinion. But I think we're all kind of on the same page. We're of, like, similar mind on this channel, so yay. I don't have to worry about it too much. I still just want to toss it in there, though. So, like I said, I did rewrite this post. I think I did a little better with my organization. And as I always say, feel free to take and use my work as you wish. I don't care if you copy pasta my entire write-up. I do not care if you take my entire podcast episode and post it somewhere else. Credit is always really, really nice because I do work very hard on these things, but that's not my goal. So, um, while I appreciate and I respect people that are like, hey, you worked hard. If you got to take this, take it. I mean... Just take it. As long as you're doing good things with it, of course. Like, if you're just taking it to, like, make fun of me or something, that's not nice. But if you want to take this to perpetuate Ashley's story, heck yes. Please do so. I'm okay with that. If you read my, if you read my write-up, I apologize. Grammar <laughs> is not a talent. If you listen to me, I apologize. Talking is not my talent. <laughs> I have no talents. <laughs> I'm not sure why you're here. <laughs> Any <laughs> well, anyway. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for being my friends if you are sticking here and listening to me. But I don't know. I don't ever feel like I'm that great. Anyway, um, enough about me. Let's go ahead and talk about the case. I know I keep saying that. I'm sorry. I drank too much caffeine. The story. Today is July 6th, 2004, so this case is cold, but it's not that old, and I feel like it really deserves more attention because time is of an essence. It was of an essence then, it is of an essence now. It is a Tuesday, it's after the 4th of July weekend, and we are in the small town of St. Joseph, Missouri. St. Joseph is a historical town that is close to Kansas City, and it has a known history of criminal runoff from the bigger city. St. Joseph is also well known for its drug use, most often meth. It's not an all bad town. It does have pockets of really good community there, and a lot of historical value. According to the historical weather for the day, the high was 81, humidity of 81 degrees, it was partly cloudy, so it was a great day to go to the pool. 
And that's what everybody did. Around noon, Ashley's mother, TM, I just use um, initials now, for people who aren't the victim or the suspect or baddies, basically, that are reported by the news baddies, not just whoever I feel like is the baddie. Um, or, uh, you know, like officially called out by law enforcement. If they're not officially called out by law enforcement, I'm, I don't want to use their full names or anything. So Ashley's mother, TM, took Ashley and her brother to the Krug Park pool and dropped them off. Now, before people get all sassy, I'm just going to say that this is and was a very common thing for the parents to do in this area. Pretty typical, very normal sort of a thing. Ashley's family also stated that this was an activity they did pretty often. So, typical for them too. Typical for the area, typical for them. The pool, even though it's called the Krug Pool by the locals, it's actually the Northwest Complex. So, if you're looking it up on maps or something, it's the Northwest Complex. And it is across the street from the Krug Park, which is a very big historical park. The pool is operational to this day. It has very little layout changes. I have noticed landscaping began maybe about 2019 in the area. The pool has its own small little park next to it and kind of behind it. And then of course the big park is across the street. At the time in 2004, Ashley would have been 15 years old and her brother was 13 years old. TM said they returned only a few hours later and Ashley was gone, but her brother was there. Ashley was supposed to have been keeping an eye on her younger brother. TM later say, states that she wishes she had reversed the roles that day. Ashley's brother, friends, and a couple of other witnesses all said that Ashley left that day on her own accord with a friend of hers. Ashley's best friend, TBK, said that she thought Ashley was just running to the convenience store. I did put a note here that Ashley's little brother didn't remember any details at first, but started remembering details a little bit later. He was only 13, so I think we can let that pass. And he was probably wrapped up on, like, what he was doing that day. I mean, yeah. What 13-year-old is going to be, like, focused on what their 15-year-old sister is doing? Just. According to those people, the person she had left was, left with, was, the then 32-year-old Christopher Hart, a convicted felon. The law enforcement has gone back and forth on whether Hart is actually involved with this case, if he's even a suspect, or even a person of interest. The reason I'm using his name is because several times law enforcement has acknowledged that he is a person of interest and he is talked about extensively in the newspaper. So that is the premise. That is what happened that day. And I'd like to go ahead and get into my timeline of investigations. To be honest, this is not my favorite investigation timeline. I just feel like it's so loosey-goosey. I feel like there's no really tight, like, boom, 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 they did this, they did this, they did this. And I don't like that. I like data. I like facts. And there just isn't that much here. So I will do my best to put together something for you, and we'll go with it. So we're going to start with day one, July 6th of 2004. A police report was filed according to the newspaper. It was in the following days, so I don't know if that was day one or one to two days afterwards. They called Ashley's friends. This is TM. I'm, I'm assuming this is TM calling Ashley's friends. An attempt to locate her. Law enforcement does not have a waiting period for missing persons here, so an attempt to locate them would have been issued to all available police in the area when the report was filed. Then she would have been entered immediately into the missing persons database. She was entered at first as a runaway, even though that's not quite right since of her age. She was still entered as a runaway. <clears throat> she would have fall 
fallen into one of six classifications of missing persons. TM discovers the rumor about Hart and Ashley in those following days, so she didn't know about this at first. TM hears about the possible relationship between the two of them and how Hart allegedly promised to take Ashley away to California. The details about these rumors unravel over a little bit of time, so it's really unclear when this information is taken to the police and the timeline of learning these tidbits, we just don't know. LA or law enforcement does confirm that witnesses have connected Hart and Ashley, so it's a very common belief that Hart is indeed involved, even held by the LA. Ellie's law enforcement. We like our slang here. News reported that Ashley vanished on that day. Hart was breaking out of home confinement from his electronic bracelet. From a second degree assault conviction and drug possession, unlawful use of a weapon and resisting arrest. It was reported that he took it off himself, went to a packed car, stopped by somebody's house, declaring he was on his way to pick up Ashley. This is a legend, of course. <clears throat> the family at first agreed that it was possible that Ashley had just simply ran away. She had run away one time in 2001, but she returned after one day on her own, and she didn't leave the state, and she would have been in eighth grade at the time. Excuse me. <coughs> I should get it. Another Coke. Uh, another Coca-Cola. Oh boy. Can you tell I don't drink these often? <clears throat> Not sponsored. Okay. So, I, I put a note here for myself. I put, I'd like to know what her pattern was so that we can compare it to the one now. Did she pack anything at that time? Did she run away with anything? Did she leave a note? Did she give a reason? Who did she run away to? Just a pattern that we can try to measure up to. Ashley's family was reportedly very close knit and there seems to be no obvious reason for her to leave them besides maybe not wanting to follow house rules. I have a lovely quote here, which I, I love this one because I agree with it. Quote, nobody would walk away from 15 years of your life and never call anyone, never have contact with anyone, no friend, nobody. That's so that right there is extremely scary. Unquote. That was from TM in the newspaper. And I agree. I think it's I agree. I think that's scary that there is no trace, not a nana nana boo boo, not a I went here, I'm fine, no contact with a friend, just nothing. I think that's very suspicious. Ashley did not bring anything with her to the pool that day besides the clothes that she was wearing. She left behind all of her medications, her brand new kitten that she just got two months earlier. Okay, so we're going to jump to September 25th of 04. Ashley is now updated from a runaway to an endangered runaway. That is basically what she should have been updated with for the, the first time. Endangered means she just was too young to uh, be able to make good choices for herself. So she would have been at danger if she had left the state with somebody older, obviously that's not right, you know, endangered. That would have given her just a teeny bit more resources um, on the filing of her report. So I think that should have been done in the first place. Sassy sips here. I like Bunny Myers. Um, have you seen her channel? She just posts the funnest stuff. Anyway, um, she's not a true crimer. Well, no, she's not true crime. She's more like weird items and she likes uh, some haunted stuff, but she's kind of spooked out by haunted stuff, so she doesn't do that too much. Okay, so 2004, I just put some time because I really didn't have a good timeline for this one. JV is the lead investigator at the time. She did try... Oh, I just ruined that. I ruined... I tried to be all neutral. Uh, 
They try to speak with heart, but he refuses. TM now starts spending a great amount of effort to spread Ashley's story, and she gets that story posted onto 45 plus websites. Starts her own domains like Ashley.4OurAngel.com and finding Ashley Martinez's Facebook page. And who knows what else she made because she was on a roll at this time. The Facebook page is still running. I highly suggest going and finding it and giving it a follow so that you can get news directly from Ashley's mother. Now we're going to jump into 2005. The K K K K Carol Sund Carrington Memorial Reward Foundation authorized funds to help find Ashley. They had a $5,000 reward for any information leading to her safe return. I personally think they should have opened that wordage up just a little bit more and they should have put any information that led to any conclusion of Ashley Martinez. Anything at all. Because... I know we want her to be returned home safely, but we also want closure too. So I think they should have opened it bigger, but that's, I'm not the one offering that money. So it was up to them. Also during this year, 18 Wheel Angels program is sponsored by the Project Jason and they start spreading info about Ashley across the states. They're like a trucker organization. That's one of the cats playing with the boxes in the background. So August 15th of 2005, TM is saying that she speaks with the investigator several times a week about this case. She also goes and contacts the renowned psychic Noreen Reiner from Court TV in Florida. The psychic charges around $650 to $1,000 for a one hour long conversation with no guarantees, but does promise that they have experience in finding missing persons peoples. I'm trying not to say my opinion on this here because I am so irritated with, you know what, I'm gonna just, I'm, mm -mm. I, I'm gonna move on. We can talk about that another day. Um. So the police department, I thought they were so kind about this. The police department said, well, they couldn't really fund hiring the psychic because there's no protocol or funding for that sort of thing. They would entertain any tips that the psychic might come up with. So now it's July 6th of 2005. Law enforcement is saying that most of their tips are coming from Kansas City, Missouri and Olympia, Washington. But they speculate that it's because a lot of the flyers are going to those areas. And also, around this time, they attempt to talk to Hart again with no results. <clears throat> in 2006, they find a mysterious runaway in San Bernardo, California, but uh, maternal DNA rules her out as a match. November 18th of 2006, Ashley's case appears on America's Wo Most Wanted, and it was featured by John Walsh on his radio and webpage amaw.com. In this same year, JV interviews with the news press and discusses the long-term cases like Ashley's. JV says that Forsenick's evidence has been entered into missing persons database such as CODIS. Ashley was added via maternal DNA. During this time frame, JV was in contact with a caseworker at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at least once a week. And TM is working on a bill with Representative Ed Wildberger that would change the age of a minor that could willfully travel across, li across lines with an adult from like a certain year span here. And I agree. I, re I don't know if she got that bill passed, but I hope she did because it makes sense to me. At this point in time in Ashley's case, it has garnered about around 100 tips. Now we're going to jump into 2007. There is a On the Road to Remember tour sponsored by the 
community effort center for missing persons caravanning across North Carolina, and they go through 11 other states. They stopped at the Krug Park pool for Ashley and try to bring her some national attention. Thank you. That's awesome. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, so 2007 again. A news article says that Ashley borrowed a cell phone from a friend at the pool and called Hart, who then cut his house arrest band and went and picked her up. In this article, it says Ashley disappeared with him in her, sometimes it says her father's car, sometimes it says his father's car. Either way, there's a stolen car in connection with Ashley. And this car is a gray 1995 Pontiac Bonnerville with a license plate from Missouri of 377 MPY. I have the VIN number too if you want to look at my writing post. This car has never shown up again. Even though it's kind of a unique car, it was only made for a certain amount of time. Never seen again. It's possible that Ashley might have gotten into a maroon car, but that's just a rumor. Sergeant V, Sergeant JV says that around this time, leads are still trickling in. Now we're gonna jump way into 2011. We know that dental records for Ashley have been gathered for investigation later. They may have done this earlier, but this is when the newspaper mentions it, so this is where I put it in our timeline. It also starts to mention that missing, active missing cases are reviewed every five years, and they look into it for new leads. So at least we know that they are going to revisit her case every five years, as long as it stays active. Now, let's see. We're jumping ahead again. We're in July 2014, so we're switching detectives now. It's Detective Sergeant JP, and he says they've made several attempts to speak with Mr. Hart, um, who is now incarcerated in the Missouri Department of Corrections for a second-degree assault. And according to this detective, they confirmed that Hart was a POI, person of interest, but not the sole suspect. Basically, I think they were like, yeah, I know, it kind of looks like he's the only guy, but we should probably say that he's not the only one, you know, because they, they don't want to pigeonhole this. So they were kind of broad with their terminology here. In the same year, Kansas City Star Paper posts that the same detective says Hart remains a POI in the case. They also say that they are getting emails from around the country of missing Jane Doe's bodies, and he does do matching for DNA, and it rules them out almost every time. Now we are jumping all the way to 2017. According to TM, the LE did try to question Hart, but he is not cooperating. TM says, to her knowledge, they've talked to him only twice. I actually think it might be more by the way they've talked about it in the newspapers, but she's confirming that at least they've attempted two, two times. Now we're going to jump to June 13th of 2017, and we start getting a little bit more activity here. There is a sudden search that happened on the north side of St. Joseph in the area of Huntoon, it's H-U-N-T-O-O-N -O -O Road and West Highland Avenue, east of Interstate 229. It is also expanded into some private pieces of land. TM was informed, but only like the day before, and they didn't really tell her why. They were just like, hey, we're going to go do a search. So the search is assisted by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It started early in the morning on the Tuesday. A bloodhound was brought in, and the investigator, Sergeant J.S., said they were following up on some leads, but didn't say if those leads were in connection to the search. And there was a mention that this was caused by historical, like a historical lead. Now, for some drama, if this wasn't already dramatic enough, this leads to a buzz on social media <clears throat> and then not too many months afterwards a woman named jw comes forward in the news 
she claims to be Christopher Hart's cousin. J.W. claimed to see the two together prior to Ashley's disappearance. J.W. talked about um, Hart allegedly saying that he met a girl and they were going to Oregon. He also said he was going to get her from the pool the day she vanished. And J.W. said she was going to go with them, but then chose not to later because she got a bad feeling after going on a walk with Hart in the woods. He told her stories about being in that same spot with another girl, and the conversation made her feel uneasy. The walk was in Northwest Parkway, only two miles from the location where it had been previously searched a few months prior. Law enforcement had not heard this story before, and at this point the news press attempted to contact Hart and, or his legal representatives with no results. But the drama doesn't stop. I've got a note here. J.W., the alleged cousin of Hart, but she has a reputation in the community for involving herself in other cases where she may have lied. The community in general views her as a drug user with mental health issues. This is 100% alleged. These are not my thoughts. These are not my opinions. They are all rumors brought up by common public knowledge on this case. So I do not mean to harm or defame her in any way. I'm just bringing up data. Early in 2021, in the Unseen Affidavit, which we are going to cover here in a minute, Christopher Hart's mother talks about JW and says that he's, she's not Hart's cousin, but a niece of Hart's stepmother, Hart's mother outlines that JW was taken in by Hart's father and stepmother, but she had, quote, mental and behavior problems and then was given back to her mother. So, in my opinion, I think people are being a little bit harsh on JW. She personally just kind of seems like a person that cares. You can see her interview um, in the news if you want to. I would not paint her so harshly as everybody is but like I said I'm just reporting common knowledge here um, and in no way do I support this I just am just putting it here for data sake okay moving on October 26 2017 the case has now had three investigators over the years and now we have Sergeant J.S., the, he would be the 2017 investigator. Okay, um, he said that the case is still open, so he doesn't really want to talk about the case, and this is when he was like, I don't, I don't want to say if Hart's a POI or anything like that. He just said that there's been thousands of tips now turned in on the case. Fast forwarding to July of 2018. They've put out more and more flyers for Ashley, supported by her family and the Missing and Endangered Northwest Missouri and Surrounding Areas Nonprofit Organization. I did not want to mess that name up. That was a long name. Now, we're going to make a big jump from 2018 to 2021. This is the year that, in the early months, a news article broke out on Ashley's case. An affidavit comes forward, brought to the press by Chris Hart's mother. The affidavit was written in 29, or the affidavit was written in 2009, but the alleged event took place in the fall of 2004, and the knowledge of this um, event is only brought to us in 2021. <laughs> okay, so let's go over that again real quick. This apparently happened in 2004 of the fall, written in 2009, brought forward in 2021. Okay. The witness in question was DC, a former school administrator. DC was enrolling Christopher Hart's son in school when she learned who his father was. Now, I'm going to read you this lengthy quote because I think there's no other way to describe what has happened here except through Christopher Hart's own words, or Christopher Hart's mother's own words, because it's hmm, something. Um, 
quote, literally jumped up from her chair and slapped her hand on her desk and said that she knows Chris did not take Ashley Martinez as she had seen her that September 2004 with a big black man out by the highway. She said that they waved at each other. I asked her if she had informed the authorities and she said that she had. She told me that they told her she was mistaken, but reiterated she knew it was Ashley as she was vice principal at the redacted school where Ashley went to school and that she had many, many dealings with Ashley. Also, she said that Ashley had on some of the same clothes that she had seen her in at school. Unquote. That's from the affidavit. Now, if you go and read this affidavit, highly recommend that you do. It outlines that DC saw Ashley standing on the northeast corner of Frederick Street and Lenard Road with a tall African-American male. She was wearing clothes and a t-shirt when she turned north on Lenard Road and waved to DC. DC calls juvenile or the police, she doesn't remember, after the sighting. DC saw them again after her errand, walking down Frederick and across the highway bridge. The affidavit was prepared by Hart's then lawyer at the time, but I guess he quit the job, I don't know. And then, the second article comes out a couple months later, and the law enforcement reiterates that Christopher Hart is still a person of interest, and they have statements that associate the two, Ashley and Hart. And J.S., the investigator, was surprised by this affidavit. The lawyer at the time could not recall if he had even turned his affidavit over to the law enforcement. Police were able to confirm that they did speak with D.C. before, but not about this affidavit. Now, here's the drop in the bucket. Because Hart, who has never spoken a word on this case, and even had bizarre behaviors when he was asked about Ashley, decided now is the time he was going to speak up. And he went and decided to do an interview with the news press. The news press goes out there, and they report that he takes up most of the two hours talking about unrelated or semi-related legal matters. Currently... Hart is. Would you move off the keyboard? Katza? There's a cat sitting on my husband. He's keyboard and making it make noise. And then he's looking at me like it's my fault. Okay. So let's get back to this. So Hart is currently. Um, he's in St. Joe, I believe, in the, in the prison there. Currently, he's being held on unlawful use of a weapon and domestic violence charges in a case unrelated to Martinez. If you read the affidavit, you'll know what it's for. Hart did finally talk about Ashley, but he only had these cryptic quotes, and I'm, I'll tell them to you now. Let me get into my person of interest voice. <clears throat> Quote, but I guarantee you, you this, I have nothing to do with her disappearance. And if I knew of any way possible of anybody guaranteed, I would not hold information back. I don't care if it was my own mother at this point. Unquote. Hart is uh, currently writing a book called Person of Interest about his time as a person of interest. Quote, I'm going to give everything I've got in this book, including whether or not I even knew Martinez on a personal level. Unquote. I suppose uh, the news press said he went on to claim that he had more evidence in the Martinez case and that his mother wasn't even supposed to bring that affidavit to the news press. But it is what it be. A cat's doing it again. I'm going to ignore it. Currently, no arrests have been made in this case at all. So, that's the investigation timeline. 
I have a few more articles that we can go over here. Um, we can go over who Ashley Martinez is, was, and what she was wearing those days, and what she looked like um, to kind of help find who she is. Then we can cover Christopher Hart and some of his history and a little bit about him, cover some rumors and things like that, and conclude the case. So let's jump into Ashley and her profile here that I've made for you guys. So Ashley Renee Martinez, I've seen her name spelt Ashley R. Martinez. Ashley has no alias names. I don't know if she has a preference for spelling her name a certain way. She was born January 24th, 1989 and vanished July 6th, 2004. She was about 5'3 and 110 pounds with blue hair. No, sorry. She was about 110 pounds with blue eyes. Her natural hair color is a sandy blonde and she is Caucasian. She does have a scar or scars on her left arm slash wrist. She was wearing blue jeans and a short, a black top that might have had red cherries on it, red or white Reebok tennis shoes with red accents, which was a size five, she has tiny feet. Ashley's tongue, navel, and ears were pierced, and she had a ring with two hearts joined together. That ring was a gift from her mother, by the way. I was curious about it, so I kind of sleuthed it a little. She was also wearing a black bikini with red cherries um, underneath her clothes. That's why I was like, I don't know if her shirt had red cherries on it too, or if it was just the bikini. I'm not sure if people got that mixed up or what, but. Ashley was reported to have bipolar disorder and is supposedly to have left her medications behind. She might have even had an inhaler for mild asthma. Ashley could have mood swings, impulsive, and potentially risky behaviors when she was not on her meds. So, let's get into more about who she is. So, she liked to smoke cigarettes, menthols, partied, she took a, partook of marijuana a little bit. Uh, she didn't like to wear hats out of personal preference because they messed up her hair. At the time, she loved the color red, and you can see that if you check out her photos and stuff like that, you can see she's got a lot of red accents or just things like that. She liked to swim, and according to her mother, she wanted to be a model and had lots of talents like reading and writing. Some of Ashley's favorite stories were love stories, and she liked the Titanic. She hung out with friends, talked on the phone, watched Lifetime movies with her mother, and had sleepovers. Quote, most of Ashley's enjoyment was centered around her family, friends, and pets. She has two brothers, an older and a younger one, who miss her so much. Her friends still often call and check on her and us. They miss her so much. Her pets miss her too, and the love she gave them was wonderful. Two months before her disappearance, Ashley had picked out her very own kitten and named him herself. She chose a long, gray-haired kitten named Coco. He was very small when, he di when she disappeared, but now she would be so surprised of how large he is. And that's from the Voice for the Missing dot blogspot dot com. So if you want to read that full article, that's a pretty good one. Let's see, other important personal things about her. Her favorite re restaurant was Red Lobster. Ew, uh, McDonald's. That's not bad. Favorite foods are crab meat. Girl, ew. What's up with the seafood? <laughs> Vegetables, corn, peas, potatoes, tacos, and pizza. Lastly, her favorite junk foods were Doritos with cheese. That I can agree with. That is a good, that's a good junk food choice. Mint chocolate chip ice cream and Reese's peanut butter cups. Mm -hmm. Quote, Ashley's mother describes her as a beautiful girl who loves to read and has a great sense of humor. Unquote. This was from the ncmissingpersons.org, but it has a 401, 404 error now from that website. So Ashley had... Um, 
a lot of family actually. She has a lot of family and they got together often and still get together and they do honorary services for Ashley. Uh, the most recent, I want to say they did like a balloon re release, but they also did like, I think one of my favorite things is they planted her a maple tree because it's got red leaves uh, near the pool. And they just did a lot, they do a lot of good things for her in her name and in her honor. And I'll just conclude that with this quote from TM. Quote, you never give up on someone you love. Okay, so let's talk about Christopher Hart now, because I've got a small profile on him. Excuse me, I will try to convert covertly, blow my nose here. I'll just go way over here. That wasn't very covert. I'm so sorry. I feel like a goblin today. I do. I feel so gobliny. <laughs> this is why I don't turn the camera on. Like the very first time I turn the camera on, I've got like allergies and like, uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. So Christopher Hart, Christopher Matthias Hart, also known as Chris Hart. Christopher M. Hart, and sometimes used the name Raymond Michael Price, who was a deceased family member. Hart's middle name, Matthias, is often spelled in different ways. Date of birth, December 12th, 1971. If you feel like seeing photos of him, you can Google him. Lots of them come up, um, as well as news articles about his arrests. Before 2004, he kicks off his career in the late 90s with a menagerie of various incidents, mostly involving burglaries and vehicles, failures to appear. The most notable incident uh, was in his teenage years when he took a sawed-off 22 rifle and did a threatening drive-by against one of his friend's brothers. According to the news, well, we already talked about that. Yeah. Okay. So the, the thing where they were talking about how he cut off his electronic bracelet thing, I did notice that they didn't ever say when he cut that bracelet off. They just said he did it and they implied it was the same day as the pool thing. Hart did live in the same neighborhood as Ashley Martinez, according to the news and TM. So that kind of puts a little credence towards that uh, uh, relationship theory. Only 11 days after Ashley's disappearance, Hart was arrested in Olympia, Washington for purse snatching. He gave the Washington official officials the false name Raymond M. Price. And I was as, uh, as a result, they did not know he was wanted in Missouri. He was released from the Thurston County Jail and he had a warrant under his false name, so he was living pretty up there for a little bit. And then September 7th of 2004, he's arrested two months after that, after that disappearance. And Hart's landlord and neighbors say that they never saw a female with him. He lived with a cousin, and that cousin said he never mentioned Ashley. Um... Hart was then extradited back into Missouri once they figured out who he was, you know, and all of a sudden he started acting really bizarre and refused to talk about Ashley at all. Bizarre enough that they, uh, well, he was convicted of drug possession and unlawful use of a we weapon and resisting arrest, but then they sent him to the Western State Hospital for mental evaluation primate prior to his rearrangement in court. So that was around 2008. So he'd kind of like sat in prison for a while. But then he was released in August 2015 um, on probation where he tried to live with family in St. Joe, I believe. He was then reincarcerated in September of 2015. So not that long. Um, he wasn't out that long. And then in 2019, in September, he was released on probation again. So the timeline gets a little unclear here, but as of 2000 and 
21. That's this year. That's this year. Hart is in the Buchanan County Jail awaiting trial for domestic violence and unlawful use of a weapon. He's currently working on that book. And this is when the affidavit comes out and stuff like that. So, the affidavit covers uh, Chris's Hart's mother's character perception of Hart from her perspective. I will just drop this little thing here. He attempted to save his son from a civil, similar, from a lifestyle like his, um, but quote, Chris ended up doing drugs and doing crimes with redacted. Um, that's from the full affidavit. Then him and his son became hostile with each other and it came to a head in sometime around 2019. Um, I put a note here about Hart's son, D.H., because it was included in the affidavit and there are some weird points here that I just wanted to talk to you guys about. So Chris Hart's mother mentions that D.H. began to use serious drugs in 2014. D.H. suffered from mental and drug issues for years, according to her. And during a drug-fueled high, he came home talking to her about the Mexican cartel from the South End that he owed money, how he became friends with Ashley's brother, who said Ashley overdosed in a party in a field near her house. And then D.H., he, he grew up under the shadow of his father, basically, in connection with this case. So I'm sure it had an impact on him, majorly. And... 2019 his relationship started to sour with his dad he goaded his dad he attacked his father over the possible involvement in the case um and then they got into an altercation at hart's mother's house this is where the charges are applied from dh to hart and he refuses to drop those he told hart's mother quote he knew that i knew what his father had done and that i was protecting a murderer this broke my heart so this is all from the mother's per heart's mother's perspective. So just an interesting note there. Okay, we're getting close to the end, guys. We've got rumors. I've only got one. Uh, some people think that Ashley might still be in the surrounding area uh, because there was possible sightings of her at one point. I only put one rumor there, even though there's some ones out there that I think are a little far-fetched. There's one like, Oh, he put her car in the Missouri River. I don't think that the car would stay hidden in the Missouri River for very long. Um, so I didn't put that rumor in, but I guess I just did. Anyways, let's pop off to the loose notes. Speaking of the car, where is this unique car? The rumor is that it was re registered to Chris Hart's father. Um, some say Ashley's father. I do think it's interesting that Hart has a, a history of tampering with vehicles, though. Uh, is there any tangible connection between Hart and Christopher besides those witnesses? I don't know. I'd like to know what the trafficking lines are for humans in Missouri, Washington, and California. And what it might be like along the way to get somebody from there to there. The cat is distracting me so much. Um, I... We'd like to know if there was any evidence of the two of them traveling at all or even heart traveling how in the world did he get to washington uh and people don't know what car he went in or anything like that i'd like to know this does heart have a history of relationships with younger people or is ashley because ashley that would might establish a pattern at least did Ashley, was she taking her medicine like she was supposed to before she disappeared? Because that might change the investigation a little bit too, because maybe she just like wandered off. I don't know. Ashley allegedly told her friends that she was planning on running away. Did she give them a motive? So those are some of my thoughts. Now let's talk about some of the common theories around this case. The number one theory is that Chris Hart convinced Ashley to leave with him to California on her own accord. 
and there's no motive. People don't put a motive here. Besides, maybe they actually were in love. I don't know. Um, however, why would she leave her stuff? I don't get it. The next one is Hart lied to Ashley about taking her to California and then sold her to, like, human trafficking or a drug den. I think that one might be more plausible. Because we know, it looks like from the affidavit, that he used drugs. It looks like he maybe sold them. We don't know for sure, but... That could be a motive. Hart picked, uh, the, oh, so the other one is Hart picked up Ashley to do drugs with her and they went to a wooded location or something like that where something went wrong. This theory is based off the common knowledge that in St. Joseph, drug users often just go walking in the woods to do their thing. So, uh, the other one is the party and overdose theory that's based off the DH's rant. The other theory is that Hart had nothing to do with Ashley's disappearance, but because of her impulsivity, she got into a car with a stranger and was actually abducted. Um, that's, I, I don't know. Lastly, Ashley chose to run away and just cut all ties. But I would counter, how would she stay so secret for so long? And why not have any contact with anybody and not take anything at all? I don't know. So that wraps up, I mean, that wraps up the case we're talking about. We've got a little bit of a conclusion. There's not much we can conclude here. If you have theories, actually pop them in the, in the comments below because there, it, this case is so dry. Why not? As long as they're respectful, of course. I say share, 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 share until we're blue in the dang face. Her flyers. Pictures of her face, pictures of that car, pictures of her story. Share this story if you want to. Share things off her mother's Facebook page that she runs. Just share stuff. It takes just a second. It's really not a big deal. And you never know. The right person might see it. Um, if you have a tip, send it in to Crime Stoppers or to the St. Joseph Police directly at 816-271-4777. If you want to do Crime Stoppers, they, you can do it online, you can do it on an app, you can call them. So, then that, you can rename, like, be anonymous if you want to. Do not put real tips in the comments, though. I mean, theories are totally cool, but don't put your tips down there. I'm actually turning in tips on this case. I have come up with two, actually, and I'm turning them in um, pretty much as soon as I post this. But I don't want to say them because I don't want to ruin anything, you know. And they're real, they're just small things. But just still, if you're going to post a tip, not don't do it to me. Do it to Crime Stoppers, okay? Or something like that. And actually, if you are alive and you are happening to watch this or you're following your own case or something like that, and you are a part of human trafficking, please call this number 1-888-373-7888 and see if they can help you out or just start putting yourself out there a little bit to see if people can find you on the internet and then help you gotta do something girl if you're still out there and uh oh, i say we we don't give up hope for ashley i say that we keep going so everybody share okay Thanks for listening to me today. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you liked hanging out with me, even though I was really weird today. I don't know. And uh, sorry this is a bit late. I know I'm posting this a day late. Um, yeah, it is what it be. So my next case is also going to be a misery because it's going to be my second case. I am going to do... Linda Sherman's skull. So, and I had done a super deep dive of this case. So, we'll do a super deep dive next time I talk to you, okay? Alright. This is Mary, out. Bye, 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 bye.